Well, today we are here at 7, but only because it's a special day. I'm just trying to get every little detail and you know, make it perfect. Kind of just do all the, the little things that make the field look good. Wash the bases, make them really white, and, you know, fix the mound and water it, and then we're good. So, should be a good day, hopefully. All 1991 players, coaches, managers to the field, third base, dugout side. Today, we welcome the 1991 Chelsea baseball team, including the players, coaches, and managers back to the field. It has been 25 years since this team last took the field together, and on that day, they won the Class B state championship by scoring three runs in the bottom of the seventh inning. It remains the only state baseball championship ever won by Chelsea. With an overall record of 33-3, the team was able to overcome some early season adversity to win the final 17 games of the season. Along the way, the team developed an identity around the model doing the little things and finish the game. On the road to the title, number three ranked Bulldogs defeated the number one, number two, and number four ranked teams in Class B in three consecutive games, leaving no doubt about who the best team was. Thank you to the 1991 Chelsea Baseball State Champions. Play ball! Looking back at it now, 25 years later, you know, we learned a lot. And it's something special that we'll never share again. There's other huge milestones that happen in our lives that are more, much more important. But it's, it's a cool thing. It's a special thing. And it's a unique bond that only we share. Really, nobody else understands because no one else has done it. That was one of the best times of my life. When I'm having a bad day and uh, things ain't going right or something, I find myself driving by this field. It gets my head back right. I don't look here. There's also a lot of memories tied to my mom. You know, she sat right over there behind that short fence and every game and, you know, I can still hear her voice. You know, they took the dugouts and all that out of here, but that short fence is still there and I can still see her peeking over that top of that fence over there. And it's just special to me. For me, the state title is, it's in the record books, but it's, it really is a byproduct of uh, all the things that we wanted to be about. That 91 team embodies some of the best people I know today. There aren't too many days go by that some flashback of that season, that team, or one of the guys on that team, doesn't pop up into my life. For that, I'm really thankful. It was a special year and involved a whole lot of special people. Baseball back then, compared to now, it was kind of the only thing. There was no flag football, there was no, there was no youth football, there was 
I don't even know if there was youth basketball. So it was kind of the only show in town. Back then it felt just natural. You know, riding your bike around town or playing with a friend and then in the afternoon you go play baseball. I grew up out in the sticks in the middle of nowhere and I didn't have a lot of neighbors so it gave me the option to go hang out with some people that I would, wouldn't normally hang out with. We would wear like sweatbands and these hats that didn't even match. I think the only uniform that we had was a t-shirt said like green Chelsea community education, blue Chelsea community. I don't, I don't think we had baseball pants. I think we wore jeans. Tough skins, I believe they were called. <laughs> I remember that. I see a lot of pictures. Guys were wearing uh, jeans and a t-shirt and baseball glove. My dad coached a couple years. I think dads as coaches want to put their kids at first base for whatever reason. I, they just like to do that. I remember every coach, their son seemed to play first base. Actually, my mom coached me one year, which was very interesting, but... Uh... I remember my first t-ball team, the Rangers. It was a uh, Bill Colius <laughs> team. We had uh, masks on and everything, like the, like the Lone masks. Ranger. Masks, yeah. You wore masks in a baseball game? <laughs> we did, t-ball, yeah. He had us wear the Lone Ranger masks because we were the Rangers, which is unbelievable that we wore those playing baseball. I don't know if he did that to us because he wanted us to not be insecure or nervous or whatever and just have fun. We're clowning out there with these masks on, so it was, it was unbelievable. We would play at the middle school fields I remember. Ah, uh, and South School, because I remember Lucky Beeman hit the school. I remember a couple times guys would hit the ball into the other field while the, the other games were going on, and you'd have to stop that, that game and, and, you know, watch them circle the bases. But yeah, no fences, no mound, hard as a rock, dust everywhere. You go back there, it, it hasn't changed much, and they're still playing there today. I remember Jake Rindle at a younger age, he could kill the ball. He sticks out in my mind. He was someone that just looked natural, born to play baseball, I would say. I was a, more of an athlete pitching. I was a good first baseman, but I was more, in terms of pitching, I was more of an athlete that was throwing the ball, and I could throw it by people, I, or I could get people out. Pitching didn't quite uh, turn out to uh, fit my fancy as I hit three batters in a row, and. Uh, uh, broke down in tears. I think that was the end of my pitching career. You know, T-ball, all the kids hit. Everybody's waiting in line to hit, and I think I was the next one. The kid swung, let go of the bat, hit me in the head with the bat, and I remember looking down, blood just pouring in my hand. Stop baseball right there. That was my end of my baseball career. I actually didn't start baseball again back up until I was like 11 or 12. I think youth baseball, when we were growing up in Chelsea, was helping out kids, but I don't think it was um, a lot of, uh, you know, instructional type things. It was mostly roll out the baseballs and let's go have fun. I always wanted to play against guys that were older. Honestly, I can't even remember if I played Chelsea ball. Just because it, it literally, if I remember correct, it was like an eight or a 10 game league, which we thought was a joke. So I'm sorry if that offends anybody <laughs> locally, but I mean, we'd play six to eight games on a weekend. Today, there's uh, all-star teams that play regularly, you know, during the summer and they'll have tryouts for these, you know, area-wide all-star teams and then they'll go travel to other places in Michigan or even around the country to play baseball in the summer as youth. And I think that the biggest difference I see today is that they're not playing with their buddies. You miss that opportunity to develop, you know, friends. You pay two thousand dollars for your son to play for this travel team, and you go play in tournaments. And he may know only a couple kids on the team. You know, I can't say if it's better now or better then. I, I like to say it's better then. It wasn't all about having to win, win, win. It was about having fun. I just wanted to have a good time wherever I was. Right. So. Hope to go to Dairy Queen afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> I see it now with kids, they play so much and they're done after they're 10 or 12. They just don't want to play anymore, so it's just not fun. It burns the kids out. It's a different world today. You know, it's tough to, to, to try to get these kids to buy into that, that whole team mentality. You know, when you all play together growing up, it, it makes a big difference.
going into the 91 season, the drive was, was there for sure. When it was basketball season, all I wanted to do was play baseball. When it was summer, all I wanted to do was play baseball. When it was fall, all I wanted to do was play baseball. Jeremy and I had art class together with Coach Cargell, and Kerry said to us, your class, you've got some good athletes and stuff, you guys will never win a state championship. They don't have big enough programs. And he went on and on about how this just wouldn't happen. And I remember Jeremy and I saying, you know, there's a chance and, and we could. He was maybe comparing it to the wrestlers and I don't know that wrestling as a team has ever won a state championship. I don't know that. Uh, maybe some individuals that were you know, state champions, but yeah, he was very convinced that, you know, our class didn't have a chance to win a state championship in anything. Uh, I taught at Eastern Michigan University and their baseball coach was Ron Ostrike. And by that time, he had retired as baseball coach, and he was an umpire. I saw him out at the Dom Donut Shop on uh, Washtenaw Avenue one morning. I was out there having coffee and a donut. Well, I said, I've been following the Chelsea baseball team. I have a son that plays uh, shortstop on that team, and he said, they're going to win the state championship. And I, I was surprised by that. I didn't tell anybody that. <laughs> he was a baseball man. He knew what he was talking about, and he turned out to be right. To even go into the 91 season, I have to talk about 90. I really thought the 90 team, we had a shot to go where we did in 91 because 90's team was super good. I don't know what our final record was, but I know that we lost one nothing. I think it was, at Chelsea and I think it was maybe the regional finals or quarterfinals or something. After the loss, I remember we were down the left field line afterward and it was, whew, it was hard to see guys just bawling uncontrollably. And it, you get a feeling of, wow, this is important. That drove me unbelievably. I didn't want to see the disappointment again that I saw. It was hard, super hard. I do think when you lose and you get a taste of it, uh, the fire starts to burn pretty hot for the next year. That didn't go away during the summer, and it certainly didn't go away once the school year started. I think that team in 90 showed us how to act as a team. In fact, I, I vividly remember during that season, during the 90 season, all of the teams from the Washington County area participated in a tournament and it also happened to be on the same day as prom. But that particular day with the good team, we went over there and I think it took less than three hours for us to lose a doubleheader. And we were not very good. When we got back to Chelsea High School, Coach Weldon had us gather in the weight room. I believe that he went and got a dictionary. What was the term? Heart or something, I can't remember. Commitment, Commitment. that's right. So I remember seeing a dictionary on the shelf, so I grabbed it, started walking back to the locker room, <laughs> thumbing through it myself, trying to figure out what, well, I didn't even know what it was. So finally, I found the word commitment, and I said, all right, that's gonna be good enough. He read the word commitment, and then he drop kicked the dictionary across the locker room, bounced off the wall, went over and picked it up, and I'll never forget him, thumbing through it again, looking at commitment up again, while he's mad, and we're just quiet as can be, just staring at him, waiting for the next, sound to come out of his mouth. Kind okay, of he scared myself, I think, and uh, probably 30 seconds after that happened, I felt like I was, you know, the worst coach in the history of baseball because I just, you know, lost my mind. The seniors on that team, they actually, we actually went out and practiced after he left, and it was kind of getting dark, and, and Coach finally came out and he said, I don't want you guys to practice. I want you to go home. But the point is, you got, you got to be committed to the game. I don't recall who asked me the question, but they were, you know, working for the, the paper of this, the blueprint paper. And I said, I think it's gonna be a lot of hard work, but I think we're gonna go all the way. I don't even think we threw a ball at that point when I said that. And uh, by God, it came true. I think it was the first time that I ever heard that, you know, the, you know, you need to set goals and they need to be obtainable and they need to be clearly defined. I can remember putting in my room on the, on the door. It had 
individual goals, it had team goals, and obviously the team goals were the league, the district, the regional, and the state title. Yeah, I can remember writing that too, and it's, it's in some bad writing, but it's big. I mean, it's right in your face. I remember I wanted to see it every day. I had big expectations for, for my junior year, both, you know, personally and team-wise. I, I, I knew we were pretty good. Last basketball game of the season, I'd break my wrist, you know, and that was, that was tough for me. He was kind of sprinting down the floor to defend against a fast break, and he just ran too fast into the wall underneath the basket and hit his, his wrist at a funny angle. And I don't even think he knew it was broken at the time. He knew it hurt. My immediate thought was that, it's, that was it. I thought I, uh, that, you know, my season was over. And I, I mean, I knew we would still be pretty good, but I knew my season was over. And I remember going to tell Mr. Welton and that was the, the toughest things I had to do. Sports Notes by Brian Hamilton. March 13, 1991. Junior Ben Hurst suffered a fluke accident in the final minute of the district basketball game when he broke his wrist diving for a ball. The baseball season is the shortest season of the year, and just when the good weather begins, most of the season is over. Coach Wayne Welton was counting heavily on Hurst to provide pitching and speed. Uh, we'll just have to see what happens. He felt pretty sure he had a, a good opportunity to play at the college level. And I remember talking to Coach Welton and I said, Coach, uh, it's too bad. I mean, he's, you're gonna, we're gonna lose him for the season. Oh no, he said, <laughs> all we gotta do is fit him with a glove. Well, it's only his left hand. You got an extra bat, Tucker can DH or you can do something there. So why can't he just put a glove on his hand and he still throws fine, he can even pitch. To play with a cast in baseball, I'm mean, sure today they probably wouldn't wouldn't allow it. But it's just wanting to get on the field any way you could. If I could get to it and if I could catch it, I could throw the guy out or I could, you know, I, I think I was pretty effective. You guys loved him out there, fast, right? Benny the Jet could go get anything, but then, you know, drops the ball, and I'm sure it's because of that cast. And on one hand, you want to be pissed because he dropped it. On the other hand, he's out there given everything he can when most people wouldn't even, you know, attempt to be out there with a cast on. Basketball season ended, turned in our uniforms, had our banquet, and then that weekend there was a party that uh, seemed like the whole school was at. I don't know, I was a stupid kid. You know, I made a mistake. During the party, there was a lot of drinking that was going on, and uh, there were a lot of athletes that were there. The rules were pretty clear, I, and I don't remember them specifically, but basically, you know, no drinking, no chewing tobacco, no, and that wasn't anything I ever did. So it wasn't hard rules for me to follow. There was a lot of jealous people of athletes in town, so, Quite honestly, I felt that I'd rather go over to Akel's house, hang out with guys and have gummy bears and two liters of pop. That's, that was, for me, that was fun. Party happened, kids were drinking. Somehow the athletic director found out, which was our baseball coach, Wayne Welton. And then, again, like the rumors just started flying. There was, you know, people lined up outside of the outside of Coach Welton's office, and it was just kind of a feeling of dread, like, oh my gosh, what is going on here? So we all got called in one after another. Who was there? Um, were you drinking? Why were you at the party? Party was four doors down from my house. Of course I'm gonna go there. At that point, I was really concerned for, you know, Jeremy and you both. If you're the athletic director and then, and the coach, you better I mean, you better get it right. I got called into Coach Welton's office and uh, Coach started crying. And he said, I'd have to suspend you for half the season. That did damper it a little bit. I think kind of, uh, two of our best players are now suspended for a while. Am I gonna now have to start? <laughs> <laughs> I 
Or is there they're gonna find another second baseman? Trying to fill that spot was that, you know, that was big. I was so naive, I didn't realize the impact that Jude could have. Jude's your leadoff guy, he's your table setter. I mean, Jude, I think he holds the record for most stolen bases in Chelsea history. And I mean, Jude got on, it was a triple, period. And Jude got on, a lot. Jude's speed killed, and it helped rallies. If we didn't have Jude for that senior, there's no way we would have, we might have made it out of districts. I don't recall thinking that we were gonna be state champs, you know, at that point. April 24, 1991. What a depressing feeling Saturday morning to see snow falling. The poor weather also puts a new dimension on the recent half-season suspension of four Chelsea High athletes for drinking. If all of the baseball team's rainouts are rescheduled and actually played, which is probably impossible, the suspended players will have missed virtually none of the season. So did the suspension serve their purpose? Did it affect our team? I would lobby that yes it did, but it probably only strengthened our team in the end. You know, looking back for me, it probably helped me work our athletic department policy into something that I felt more supportive of. Because in this case, not only did the two guys miss half the season, 50% of our season, which is significant. Um, they also weren't allowed to practice by the policy. So I wasn't allowed to practice, I wasn't allowed to go to the games, but I'd still show up at the games and I'd just watch from the outfield fence or watch from the car or wherever, because I just had to be there. And so I never missed a pitch. I'm sure that was tough for him. Probably even tougher to tell him that they weren't going to Florida with us, because that was, one of the best times ever. You know, playing on that hot red clay, just the advantage that that gave the baseball team to be able to practice outside when it's still cold here in Michigan. That time other teams around Michigan that I knew of weren't even doing that. They'd be practicing inside or not practicing at all during spring break. Lots of other Chelsea people, it seems like, just migrated down and Venice became like the Chelsea of the South for, for one week out of the year, every year. What I really remember about spring break was, you know, the packing of the cars, the night before, the lining up of the jerseys, the meticulous folding of the clothes that my dad would do and the lists he would make. I remember getting our uniforms, the baseball pants and the hot shirt and, and, and all of those things. And he always had them all neatly laid out. He wanted the team to feel like this was going to be a quality experience. It was a detail and details are really important when you're trying to build a championship program and culture. And you know, if I look back on it, I wouldn't think that was anything out of the ordinary. It's fun. I loved the drive downs the, in the vans. To me, with that camaraderie, that was fun. The ride down with the CBs and just being kids. If we had a parent meeting today and told parents that we were gonna travel the way we traveled the first, well, I'll say the first 20 years we took that trip, people would probably lock you up and shackle you and take you away. At that time, we had three school vans, and then Coach had his truck, which he took down. He hitched a trailer with all of our baseball equipment, and the, the back of the truck was covered, and three players would ride in the back of the truck all the way down to Florida. Luckily, I was never one of them. No, pick up with a plastic or tin or whatever those things are that cover the bed. That's it. Wow, mat. You had a mat back there. Oh yeah, we threw a few gymnastic mats and a few sleeping bags and the pillows in there. And the years we had a little slider window from the back to the front was kind of a bonus. I can remember having my head through the, the camper window and then the truck window and somebody swerved two lanes, hit the guardrail, and Coach Walton, he kind of had his arm up and just kind of this and we were around it and I'm just thinking, I'm, I'm just going to kind of head to the back. I'm just going to head to the back now. Never crossed my mind like, oh, if anything happened, 
were thrown out of this thing. That's, that's crazy. I can't believe that my parents allowed it. Michael's mom had a tradition of always making a big batch of fried chicken for us to go down. That's what we ate on the way down. Drive for 18, 20 hours, whatever it is. Yeah, no, nothing to entertain nothing, ourselves no but ourselves. except ourselves. <laughs> Lots of stories about things that happen in the ride down. I can't verify any of them, but uh, I'm sure some of the guys you've interviewed have. <laughs> Jude was the guy who invented the show me your blank sign. I think it started at the back of one of the vans. Um, I believe it said, quote unquote, show us your tail. Um, and that kind of developed over the years because uh, we kept on seeing more and more <laughs> He held it up to me and he started giggling, you know, as Jude only could. And then he started showing the passersby and sure enough, you know, it wasn't too long before we had some women complying with, with our request. We stayed at a KOA, actually Ron Nemeth, our AD at the time, stumbled onto that KOA and but it wasn't really what I envisioned either, so I remember saying to Robin Raymond one day, hey, the KOA, we can't do that anymore. And he said, well, my dad stays at a place called Rambler's Rest, but there's no way they're letting you guys stay there. <laughs> I said, really? Rambler's Rest, that place is a gem. I mean, a lot of wood paneling and a lot of just tin shacks. There was a swampy area, and if you went out there at night and flashed your lights, you'd be able to see the crocodiles you know, the alligator eyes looking at you. We were down by the water and uh, someone had started the rumor that I had touched an alligator. There were alligators out there, but there was, I, I, they never were near me. For the longest time, because I wore number eight, Coach Welton would call me Aider. Well then, after that moment, it became Gator. It's like a retirement community. They had a billboard with all our articles from the previous year, they, they, the whole community followed us and there'd be lunch, but then they'd go bake cookies for us and bring cookies on the table. It was just sort of like they adopted the team. We'd always get there early in the morning and we would pitch the tent, set up our cots. The next day, it was time for baseball. We'd stop at a 7-Eleven and that was breakfast. I'm sure it was a super healthy, you know, bag of donuts or whatever. I just remember grinding every day. It was, I was so tired at the end. Towards the end of the week, I went to a movie just so I could sleep and air conditioning for a couple of hours because I was just exhausted. Getting up every morning, you know, you're sore, you're sunburned, you're tired, you, you throw on your clothes, same clothes every day. Put on a wet bandana around your neck to try to stay cool somehow. And the tent was, everybody thinks it's so, it's not sweet, it's not cool. Sleeping in that army tent, Oh, the smell. I still can smell that smell. Some of the times you were almost better just going to sleep on the baseball field or whatever because those cots, it was so hot in some of those tents. It was hot, and had a cast on, and sweating, and it stunk. It wasn't fun. One of the years it rained and it's just a, a mess. I mean, it's just a mud pit, cesspool of just high school dudes, man. I remember at least one spring trip where a tornado touched down like a mile away and looking over my dad was holding down the tent with his two arms and uh, keeping the water from running into the side of my brother's mouth. Yeah, I mean that's what great coaches do. I mean they find a way to, you know, bring teams together and unique ways to do it and that was Coach Walton's way of team bonding and I'm not even sure we were smart enough to, to understand that, you know, this would bring us closer together by sleeping 25 guys in an army tent, but that was the brilliance of Coach Walton. There were so many good times, and uh, do it again in a second. In that 91 season, spring training was different because we had two key guys suspended. I think that the coaches probably had a good idea who they wanted to play, but until you get in an actual game, you don't know how people are going to react. It goes back to a core philosophy about if you want to build a winning baseball program, you better be strong up the middle. And we struggled early in my coaching career finding an absolute elite defender behind the plate. The worst sound in baseball for me is the sound of that ball hitting the chain link fence behind the backstop. As a matter of fact, that makes the hair stand up in the back of my neck right now. I remember Coach Welton coming to talk to me and saying, 
we need somebody to catch and you know the fact that you're athletic and you've played football and stuff we'd like you to do this I was scared to do it then I remember that I mean I just had never done it never had the gear on I had a little bit of trouble throwing the ball back to the pitcher I could throw people out at second base I could throw it from the outfield in but when I had to throw it back to the pitcher it was tough I'm sure a lot of people remember coach Tickner Tick would stand up from the dugout and go Jesus Christ Tucker throw it back to the pitcher put more pressure on me than anything then it was really hard to do Adam came in to be a catcher at that point because Coach Welton was probably thinking there's no way he's coming on varsity and going to not throw the ball back to the pitcher. We need somebody that can and I think Adam was a whole lot better at it than I ever could have been. In my heart I felt like that I kind of I kind of belonged but I needed to figure out where. Once he figured out that's where he needed to be that's all it took. He would succeed. To what level? I didn't know but he would succeed. From there you go up the middle of the infield and you want to be really good at second and short and you want to be really good in center field. So starting there, that's kind of how, in my mind anyway, I wanted to build our team. Early on we identified we didn't have a center fielder. So I remember taking Benny Hurst to Florida when he was a freshman and uh, that was unheard of. But we needed somebody and we needed that position was so important. I was a pitcher, I, I was the catcher, I was in the, the middle of, you know, wherever the action was. He trusted me with this position that was a pretty important position as an outfielder. I wanted to be the best center fielder. So we move on to the infield. I knew we had Jude Quilter coming. Probably all the things you'd want in a second baseman. Fleet of foot, quick hands, solid defender. No questions asked there. He's gonna be the guy. I think there's certain toughness involved at second base. He's gotta stand in there and uh, deal with that runner coming in after him. Throw the ball at his head if he was not sliding. Something I enjoyed was to stand in there and, and take that from, from that runner. The real challenge for us really was whether we could make Kerry Plank a shortstop. Those four spots were taken up by guys who were tough, that if the stuff hit the fan, and it always does in the game, that they would be able to handle it. At the beginning of the year, we were still trying to figure out who we were. The very first game of the year, we played Pioneer. We were able to tie that game in the seventh inning, as I recall, and win it in 10 innings. That alone showed a lot about the character of, of what this team was going to be, even though it was still incomplete. Pinckney, Milan, Dexter, Lincoln, back then the Southeastern Conference was, there was no easy doubleheader. We were 33-3 and three in 91. I don't even know how we only lost three games because Tecumseh and Celine were incredible. Well, we lost the first game against Celine. We needed that. We needed that. We were too cocky. And Clem was probably the cockiest of everybody. We got destroyed 11 to 1. Uh, it was probably the worst game I pitched my whole life. I hit five people. We made errors in the field. Nobody really hit the ball. We only scored one run. It was a good wake up call for everybody. We went out and we laid a, an egg. I mean, we got crushed. You know, maybe we don't know what's going to happen here. We lost the second game against Willow Run. It was really windy that day. I remember. And I remember fly ball that was hit to me. And at the last minute, I had to move my hand to compensate for the wind. And the ball hit in his glove and popped right out. Uh, basically a result of him not being able to squeeze it. It was maybe one of those things where we thought luck wasn't going our way. It wasn't the fact that we lost that game. It was the fact of how they won it. I remember being on the mound and they had a guy on third and I went into my windup and their coach yells, he's going! And I moved ever so slightly without stepping off the back of the rubber and they called the balk on me and the run scored. That was actually the run that won that game for him. Losing a game didn't bother me as much as him doing that. I wanted to whip the ball over at him like I was gonna pick the next guy off and hit him in the forehead with it. But that's not what we do. I just thought it was classless. And you would never, ever hear something like that come out of our coach's mouth. 
Who wants to win a game like that? First game back was uh, Pinckney, I believe. I remember a, a ground ball to my left that I went in the outfield for. I uh, spun around uh, and threw the guy out at first, and it's kind of like, yeah, I'm back. We were all thinking that when, when Jude made that play, you know, it's like just having him and Jeremy out there, it's like, yeah, we're all back. We were a well oiled machine again. I do vividly remember their first game back. We were playing at Pioneer High School. We played Pinckney. And I was up in the first inning and hit a home run. That was my only home run of the year. Gary hit a home run. We're like, oh, yeah. Craig comes up and hits a home run. We're like, holy cow, it's back to back. You know, and Joe Boo, obviously with the name, he couldn't hit a curveball, but you know, he could still, he could walk into a fastball and send it sailing. There's a big celebration. The next guy gets up, Jake Rendell. Boom. Jake ripped one. We're like, what? I'm on deck. I've never hit a home run in my whole life of baseball. He wasn't really known as a power hitter. Boom. Fourth home run in a row, Rob Clem comes up, okay? Rounds the bases. I don't think I ever sprinted around those bases that fast. I remember, I, I think I broke Coach Walton's hand going around third. And then as only baseball can play it out, Jeremy's first at bat has to come after the four guys in front of him hit home runs in a game. <laughs> yeah, he's got to follow this parade of home runs, and if you know Johan, you know he's trying to hit one out. So I'm up for my first at-bat of the season, and I'm thinking this guy, if he's, if he's any good, is gonna hit me in the head, because I know if I was pitching, I probably would've hit the fifth guy coming up to hit a home run off me in the ear and caught it good. Sort of baseball etiquette there. And I ground out. And I thought I grounded out to second, but I saw in the scorebook said shortstop, but I think it was second. And of course, I come back to the dugout, and I still, 25 years later, have to hear about how I grounded out. I mean, all of a sudden, we're just having fun. Now it's it's like we're back. We are just having fun and winning. Clem and Jake got into a groove. It's uncommon for a high school team to have two guys that can knock the bat out of your hand. We had two of them that could knock the bat out of your hand. There, there is no doubt in my mind, Rob Clem was far and away better than I was as a pitcher. You guys know how great he was, and the people on the team do, but other schools and all that stuff, they knew Jake, because Jake had all the press and all the stats and all that. But I've seen a lot of baseball, and Rob Clem is you know, probably one of the best that have come through here. He was fearless, so it didn't matter if a guy had hit a double off and he's like, this next guy is mine. And he was ruthless out there. I mean, he just was, he attacked every hitter. There was nobody that he was afraid of. And he just went at him. Yeah, I didn't throw around 90. I mean, I think a hard shot through was 86, 87, which was still pretty good. I had really good control of my curveball. That's why the curveball was my L pitch. I mean, I don't know how many times I struck people out throwing a curveball on a 3-2 pitch. A lot of people aren't expecting a curveball on a full count. Jake was also confident in his own abilities, but I felt like as it crept closer, you know, he was, he would get like, wow, I'm not so sure. But then if you could get him to the rubber, he was very sure at that point, after pitch one. He had ability, what I called, to throw low strikes. When he stretched out and released, the ball was two feet off the ground and it just stayed at that level. And that's hard to hit. Half an inch lower, it's a ball. Coach Welton's baseball team, to the surprise of no one, won both games of the Southeastern Conference Tournament to win the league title in convincing fashion. Jude Quilter's towering home run over the 12-foot fence in left field, which probably surprised a few folks on the tennis courts where the ball landed, was the dramatic game-winning hit. I've been told, been told Quilter, Quilter even cracked even a smile cracked while he ran the bases. While running the bases. Anyone who's been following this team has to feel good for the veteran coach as well. For much of the season, Welton has had to spend a great deal of his time at Mott's Children's Hospital, where his son Joey has had two operations. I remember before Joe was even born having some conversations with Coach, and they were painting a pretty bleak picture, and, and that was on his mind, you know, the whole time. Joey had a whole 
troubled pregnancy, really, when Joe was uh, being developed. He, uh, Dr. Curtis said that Joe probably wouldn't be normal. To some degree, he was right. <laughs> he would get bouts with uh, what we know now were pediatric migraines. Plus, he had a obstruction in his small intestine that uh, we couldn't identify, so they went and moved, removed a piece of his small intestine. So that was uh, just prior to the pre-district, so all that was going on. He's in and out of the hospital. So I was spending nights in the hospital, and uh, coming back the next day, next morning, doing my AD work, getting through practice, back to the hospital, spending the night with Joe. I don't ever remember him expressing any concern or letting on that there was, you know, anything more serious than maybe there was with Joe. You didn't even know he was going through any of that stuff. I don't know if you even know, I spent most of that season living with my grandparents, which I think made that particular year of my spending time in the dugout even more special because that was probably most of the time I was getting with my dad. So I had to tell Akel and Fred and Patch, I said, hey, take the guys up to follow I'm not gonna be there, Joe's you know, getting operated on right at game time. So I said, Pitch Jake three or four, get Rob in there for three or four, and just get on home. As yeah, being a father now, there'd be no hesitation. I'd be at the hospital with my son. It just showed faith that he had in our team and in our assistant coaches too, which was nice to see Akel be able to take it over. What I remember from that game was Coach wasn't there because his son was having surgery. And I remember Akel about sh his pants. No cell phone, no Twitter, no way to follow it, no, no, I don't know what's going on. He knew Fowlerville had beat us before. They had, that was one of our losses out of the three. I mean, the team's record was horrible, if I remember correct, but you're still talking, we're going to a pre-district qualifier, whatever they called them back then. I'd be upset as a coach that my team has to go to Fowlerville and play against Fowlerville. Fowlerville had a crappy field with didn't have a fence and it had a like a football grandstand out in center field that I think Rindle hit it into. I caught one really good that day. I remember Jake hitting a bomb that day. I absolute bomb. And I want to say it was to right center. And I don't think it was a home run. I don't think they had a fence, is my point. How in the heck can you hit a ball into the bleachers and it and then come out and say, oh, that's a ground rule double? It was weird. It was just one of those weird days. I just don't think we were. We weren't locked in like we needed to be. And that game was almost one pitch away, and not even a pit, one call away from ending the season right there. We didn't do what we should have done early in the game, so then all of a sudden it got, it, it did get a little tight. We were down, and we had two outs, and I think it was Bone was up to bat, and Bone had two strikes on him, and he took a pitch, and it was like right on the edge. And the ump, came up like this to ring it out. I thought, oh, man, that's the end of it. But it wasn't. I mean, I, I choked. I mean, it was a pitch that was way too close to take. It was a full count. And I think the umpire choked with me. He called it, you know, his hand goes up, but he calls ball four. Ball. He was halfway done with the third strike call, and for some reason he pulled back. So I don't know divine intervention or whatever. It was like slow motion, because that was it. If he if he calls strike three, game's over, we're done, we lose. And we were ranked like third in the state or something. I mean, we were a decent team. We weren't even gonna make it into districts. So there's the catcher and the umpire, there's a, a certain rapport that goes on. And I do think that he respected Adam. You know, Adam's a catcher. So he would take a pitch that was not a strike, right? You'd like to think that the game's not like that, but I mean, subconsciously maybe, yeah probably blocked the ball so he didn't get hit that day. <laughs> Maybe he was looking out, good looking out. I was able to, to get the run in to tie the game and, I, and we eventually won that game. I want to say team of destiny or anything like that, but when, you, when things like that happen, you know, you start thinking, well, we got a real chance. I mean, it was, let's get the hell out of here. <laughs> One of those, kids we got out of here with a win. It's pretty embarrassing that we were that close that in a pre-district game to being not even here talking 25 years later. My take is, thank God he didn't call it a strike. 
I don't think we were ever not focused again. I mean, we were locked in after that point. When I got home, I, I, I actually threw up. I mean, that's how stomach churning those situations were. Now, why it took me until I got home, I don't know. I remember Echo calling the hospital room like 10 o'clock that night. And I answered and uh, I said, well, he said, well, we won, but <laughs> so he proceeds to tell me the story and as only Aiko can tell it, he kept saying the whole game he's thinking, what am I going to tell Wayne? I don't know what I would have done. I don't know if I could have called Wayne and told him we lost. I don't know if I could have actually called him and told him that we lost. So I think it was just relief that, you know, we didn't lose. Not that we won, that we didn't lose. Sports Notes, June 6, 1991. Things look bleak for Wayne Welton's baseball team. They open with cold water, a team with five likely major league draft choices on its roster, and three of them did not start in the big games due to disciplinary problems. If by some chance cold water goes cold, the Bulldogs will probably face the state's number one ranked team, Dearborn Divine Child. What does the Chelsea team have? All right. Their pitching, Their pitching is, okay. is okay. Primarily, they have a bunch of seniors who just graduated can't and can't wait, wait to get their own apartment so they can, let's just say, let's just say they're distracted. distracted. <laughs> it's probably pointless to get off I-75 at exit 18, take, take a left, left on Nadu Road, road go, go two miles over the viaduct, viaduct turn left at the stoplight at Dixie, Dixie Highway, and proceed to the baseball complex. Absolutely pointless. But I'll probably see you there. We graduated and I went to work the very next day for my dad. And then I go to baseball practice and you know, I couldn't wait to get there and to see everybody. You just had a desire to not let it in. I loved high school. I loved coming to school. Not a lot of people could probably say that, but I did. I knew after baseball season, it was go time. It was getting to get real for me. Somewhere during that season, it turned into I just want to play every game I can with these guys. There's no better time up to my life at that point that I'd ever had. It was just every day, it was just Disneyland. It was unbelievable. The community was a buzz for sure. You go into the barber shop and Gary's, you know, talking about it and everywhere you went, you're a little bit of a rock star in your hometown. It seemed like the town's folks were a little nicer as you started getting farther and farther. I mean, they'd stop you on the street if they knew you were on the team. We didn't really know much about cold water. Coaches may have, but player-wise, we didn't know anything, but they had three or four studs on there, and, it, and we shut them down. There was some discussion about who should pitch that first game, and Coach Walton said, if we don't win the first game, we're not playing in the second game. I remember Rob Clem, I believe he threw a perfect game. It was as fast as any game I've ever seen in my life. It was like an hour and 15 minutes. I think only three guys in the entire game touched a ball, and they were all foul. I don't even think we had to make a play. I remember thinking to myself, well, hmm, that wasn't too bad. Uh, <laughs> if this is one of the teams that we're supposed to have to be along the way to go, then we might be all right here. It was a pretty quick game. That's the way Clem threw. It was, Clem's like 50 pitches, and hey, I'm done. When the game was over, we're all in the dugout. I mean, we're all happy we just won our you know, district game. You know, we're all just kind of celebrating. And coach was like, you know, some of everybody down and says, looked at me and says, do you realize you just threw a no-hitter, right? I'm like, what? He says, no. He says, no, you threw a no-hitter. And everybody else kind of laughed because I think everybody else knew but me. And that set the stage for, you know, arguably the state final game aside. I could argue that the regional final game was the most exciting, best game in the history of our program. We didn't really play people from that league. We stuck to Washtenaw County area. We would go west to Jackson, but we didn't very often go east, you know, Dearborn and Detroit and, and those places. I, I'm not sure we knew quite what we were getting into. I remember people from the other, from Divine Child, just kind of being almost like, like, well, you know, this is just a formality that we're playing this game. Their thought was they're just gonna trounce on us and they're, they're, they're already talking about the team that uh, they were going to play next. There was lots of talk and back then we didn't have the internet and our phones and everything else. Uh, 
so Ann Arbor News and you know everybody else is picking them to win for sure. You would hear they would take infield without their gloves, stuff like that. You heard about this pitcher that was supposed to be so good and he was shutting everybody down. But you know my take was on that is they he didn't throw against us and he he don't know our pitcher. The one game obviously Divine Child I was worried about uh, and it's hyperventilating and everything like that because I knew I was on the mound. <laughs> Jake would sit in the library during school and, and research all the teams and knew, seemed like he knew every player on every team in the state of Michigan and he knew their stats. Well, Jake had, for whatever reason, built Divine Child up in his mind as, as the Detroit Tigers and we were about to go play him. He didn't even want to pitch. Hey, may, he said to Coach Walton, hey, maybe you, ought to, maybe you ought to start somebody else. I don't know who the hell he wanted, who else is going to start? Jake is over there before the game starts, sitting on a cooler. Oh, this is Divine Child. This, you, you, th these guys are good, man. They, they're good. They recruit. They got the best. These guys are good. I don't know if it was before the game, but I know during the game I had ice packs all over my head and stuff. I remember towels. It felt like I was overheating. It was almost like he was thinking too much. He's such a competitor. Once He, he just needed to get out there. He wasn't going to turtle up once he got out there. Somebody probably gave him like Benadryl or something before he went, got hit with a tranquilizer dart. Typical self where he didn't feel like he was good enough, yet he was probably the best player on the field that day. I'd love to see the box score on that game because I know, I can't tell you how many guys I had with two strikes and I could not strike these guys out. How are these guys putting the ball in play so much? And that, that's what I think made everything so tense. He had damn near a full beard though by the time that game started and he shaved in the morning that day. <laughs> you know, the difference in a game like that is just one or two plays. You're going to see a pattern of heroism and redemption developing here. Jude was up in the top of the last inning, so the top of the seventh inning. Fastball in the outer half of the, the plate and uh, just lined it to right field. Not really a gapper, kind of at the right fielder. Uh, he dove at it and missed it. You know, when Jude got that ball into the outfield, Forget it, just smooth, just so fast. Being I was already in fourth gear, I actually did find a fifth gear to get around the bases. I was told that I was held up by Akel at third and uh, blew a stop sign. I, did, I, didn't re I didn't remember that, obviously, because I blew through it. I don't think I've ever seen anybody run that fast around the bases. Yeah, he was yeah. quick. Yep. And it was just a dusty slide in the home plate. I mean, it was just poof. Slid in head first and jumped about 10 feet in the air, and I think somebody grabbed me before I even landed has an inside the park home run, basically to take the lead in that game, in the, in the very last inning of that game. That was the first game that year my dad came to. I know that he would love to bend to everyone, but you know his work schedule never allowed it. I was playing first base that day, and to end that game, a guy popped up, I realized that I was not gonna get to it. Really out of desperation, I just kind of went back and jumped backwards. Literally fell back on my back on my head. I remember actually through the air, I'm like, oh my God, I got it. And I'm, I'm rushing in, Craig's going back. He kind of caught off his shoulder, kind of fell. And I remember I just jumped down and tackled him right there. I got up and raised my hand and by then, everybody was out there because it was the end of the game. We won it at that point. It was the third out. I remember looking over at my dad, and uh, he just gave me a, a simple like that. that. That meant a lot to me. That meant, that meant a lot. I remember thinking, we are a force now. We are a force. If we just beat the number one team in the state, you know, who, who else out there can beat us? I mean, we're Chelsea. I mean, no one's ever gone this far before in baseball. I mean, it's un uncharted territory for us. It was scary, but it was all, uh, it was exciting too. Sports Notes, June 12, 1991. I won't speculate about this weekend except to say Chelsea has as good a shot as anyone. There is no weakness in any part of their game. If you want to go to Battle Creek to watch the Bulldogs pursue a state baseball championship, Parents and team supporters have organized one large caravan to Bailey Park. The caravan will take I-94 West to I-194 North. Exit at Capitol Center. Yeah, we painted the rock and uh, 
we had kind of coined the season uh, motto uh, is finish the game coming from the movie Young Guns and that was pretty popular that summer and we watched it a hundred times it felt like. Johan would never shut up about Young Guns and stuff like that. It was so annoying because I hated that movie. I remember getting in the van heading to Battle Creek and I'm not kidding, uh, Queen was playing We Are the Champions. <laughs> what? I swear, I'm not even wow. kidding you. you know, I just said it felt that we were going to win. It was packed. The, the stands were absolutely packed. There wasn't an empty seat. I mean, we were in front of what felt like most of the town. I don't think I'd ever seen that many people at a Chelsea game. It was unbelievable. They were everywhere. You'd, you'd see the benches just full and realize how many people were there. But kind of in the midst of the game, you really realized nobody was there. We felt almost like celebrities. It was just kind of a cool feeling. Um, I mean, it's probably as much fame as you're going to get in small town Chelsea, but it, it kind of made us also, I think, want to win it for the town. I made the big banner out of butcher paper. It was probably about 30 inches high. Really a nice little piece of artwork. Bullet Creek also had a big crowd. I remember their crowd being really, really loud. I feel like they had cowbells and all kinds of stuff. They were really into it. We don't like them. They don't like us right off the bat. So uh, warm-ups for the uh, championship game. I said, hey, Kerry, get, uh, get Ken to chuck that uh, next ball to first base over up into the crowd. Ken Slane was our backup uh, shortstop. So Kerry goes and talks to him. Ken's like, yeah, sure. Sure enough, Ken gets that ground ball from uh, uh, the coach during warm-ups and just hucks it 20 feet over the first baseman's head right into the stands. <laughs> and they shut up for the rest of the time. <laughs> <laughs> Bullet Creek, the team we played in the, in the finals, they certainly were very intimidating. I just remember they had a lot of stashes. They had a lot of uh, raccoon tails and man, they, they put my beard to shame. Yeah, I remember them being big. Big, 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 like they didn't belong in high school. I mean, they looked like they were college baseball players. These guys look like a men's slow pitch softball team. And they, it seemed like they were 6'3", 250. I don't know how all of them had beer guts and beards, but they all seemed like they did too. I mean, they were huge. You know, this was a team that set what was at the time the home run record for a season in Michigan. And that placed them like eighth in the nation all time as a team hitting home runs. I remember going out to home plate and meeting their head coach for the first time. And I remember him saying how disappointed that their players were, that they weren't playing Divine Child, that they had to play us. And I remember turning my back to walk back to our dugout. In a rare moment for me, I, I looked up at the sky and I thought, there is no way you're letting them win this game. <laughs> the team comes together in the dugout before we take the field and the coach has an opportunity to say a few words for the team. And coach said, let's go play Chelsea baseball but he couldn't get it out when he started crying. We were doing it for the team last year, our seniors from last year, our captains. And we were doing it for all the teams that didn't get a chance before. We were doing it for our town. Felt like we were doing it for our parents. And I looked over at Jude, and I looked over at Craig at first, and I just remember thinking, this is the last time. It was the final chapter, and it was the last time we were ever gonna play together. And we took the field. June 19, 1991. No, I gotta have these. Saturday's Class B State Baseball Final was, quite simply, the most thrilling high school sports event I have ever seen. Parents, Parents were, were alternately ready, ready to burst into tears, tears of, joy, of joy or throw up behind the stands. I think it was in the finals. Did they run the fake pickoff on Jude? I remember that. They knew I was aggressive at first base, so they made a move on me at first base. This is early in the game. The pitcher steps off the rubber, fakes a throw to first, and as Jude's diving back to first, their first baseman takes off in foul territory, seemingly to chase down an errant throw. Well, in reality, the pitcher still has the ball in his hand. I can't believe a team ran that. It's, I mean, it was, it was like something back in my 12-year-old days. The crowd starts 
acting like, oh my God, you missed the ball. Like they're into it and they're all looking for the ball. It's almost like something that they had planned. It's maybe, like maybe they had a city meeting or something and they <laughs> got up and started taking off to second base. Tucker was standing there looking at me like, uh, what the hell are you doing? And now what do I do? I don't remember how it worked out. I guess it must've been a good hidden ball trick because I'm still a little confused. So I think he ended up uh, getting in a pickle uh, run down between second and third and I uh, ended up uh, getting to second base, but uh, heck of a play. I kind of respected that team up to that point and what they were about, but once that happened, I kind of lost respect for them. This isn't the number two ranked nationally eighth home run hitting team in the, in the world. I mean, these guys are Bush League. The Bulldogs fell behind early, 2-0, on a 385-foot homer to right center. Keep in mind, this park does not have high school dimensions. Straightaway Straight center, center field, field is 400, 400 feet, feet and, the and the fences are a good are 10 feet high. I figured Chelsea pitching has finally met its match. We talked about wanting to pitch away from them because we were worried about their power. They hit the home run in the second or third inning or whatever it was, third inning maybe. I know that guy crushed that ball. Wow. Damn, he hit that ball well. And that was the first time during the season that it really felt like that, like, damn, are we going to be able to respond to that? Holy crap, these guys can crush. If we didn't do something, you know, they were going to pound the ball on us. We're either about to get beat down here or we got to do something different because I wasn't throwing a ball by them and we decided we gotta go in on them. Their crowd going crazy, just crazy. And I remember it just dead silence on our side. And I remember being in the dugout thinking, that's really stupid. Forget the fastball away business. If you're gonna get that pitch on the inside and turn on it, you have to get that bat head all the way through the zone out in front of you. You're gonna take Jake's 90 mile an hour fastball and see if they can turn on that. And right there, they re-strategized the entire game. We're gonna go inside, we're not going outside, let's do this. I mean, the entire game plan flips on one swing of the bat, and Adam and Jake just go back to work. And it changed everything in the game, because all of a sudden these guys weren't, weren't used to getting busted in on their fists and were having a hard time with those inside pitches. As it turned out, that was the best thing we could have done, because I really did, for the most part, hold them at bay. The Bulldogs eventually fall behind 3-0 before rallying for three runs to tie the game. We would stand along the third base rail when we were in the field and then when we were up to bat I'd come behind the plate. I don't I must have just been nervous or something. But then some other people started doing that too. So it was this progression of people out in the field and this progression of people behind the plate. We kind of scratched and clawed back a couple of runs, and we were able to tie the game. At the bottom of the sixth inning, we had an opportunity really to blow that game wide open. We had the bases loaded with no outs, and our top three hitters were up. So it was Jude, Adam, and I. So we had a real opportunity to, to score some runs and take the lead and kind of seize the momentum of that game and we would get out of the inning without any damage. And I think that was in itself a, mo a big momentum swing for them. There was a play in that game, and this is the famous I got it, you take it story. The ball was hit hard. I think there was, they had two guys on. And I remember their hitter absolutely hit a missile. The left center, when he first hit it, I thought it was going out. I thought it was a definite double, especially big that field was. And I remember thinking to myself, oh no. And as I was turning, I just see Benny was playing straight up. To me, it felt like he came out of nowhere. He was just a flash coming across my vision. And it was one of the best catches I personally had ever seen. I just thought there was no way in hell that he was gonna catch it. You know, Johan can tell all the lies he wants. I mean, that, there was only one guy in the field that was gonna catch that. I mean, it was Benny. I don't remember it being a particularly difficult catch. I mean, a running catch, yeah, I was on my horse, but not something I wasn't going to get to. He was camping under it. He was there, but the center fielder gets whatever he can get. You're the center fielder. You 
take precedent over both outfielders and the infield. I guess Johan was going, I got it, I got it, and then he yells, you take it. All of a sudden, I hear Benny, I got it, I got it, I got it. He's like in a frantic panic when I hear him coming. I can't go behind him because it's, it's already, I'm already there. So I peel off in front. I just felt like I got a great jump on it and I'm gonna make this catch. I made the catch. I was already there. I had to move out of his way because he's coming like a freight train. It was a great catch. Probably one of the best catches I've ever seen. Um, but like I always say to Benny, he didn't need to make it that hard because I was standing there. So. <laughs> We've dodged a bullet. Everybody's breathing a sigh of relief. The very next batter, Jake throws a ball a little bit in the dirt and it kind of skips away from Adam Taylor. I wasn't throwing many balls in the dirt that were fastballs that day just because of the adrenaline. So I'm assuming it was a curve ball and I probably just buried it. Jake buries a breaking ball in the dirt just exactly where you want it, the way you want it. Adam blocks it perfect. It goes in the left field. And that guy scores and Johan charges it just like he's taught. And ball hops over his glove and two runs go. And now the circus is really on. Yeah, it's a track meet now, yeah. Just the enormity of the situation just, I'm sure, got to him. And he just, I'm sure he threw that thing 104 miles an hour down there. As soon as that happened, I was like, oh. And then I looked down, and I see, you know, Jeremy's running in hard on it, and just overran a little bit, hopped over his glove, went past him, and just, ugh. And I thought, that's the ball game. And I may have just lost the game for us. Shows you how hard Adam throws the ball, because most guys that throw down to third base, if you don't get the ball, it's not going through the outfielder and continuing to go from there. I don't know how bad the throw is. I don't necessarily remember the throw, but it certainly wasn't good enough for the guy to catch it. I remember not feeling very good about it. My heart broke for him, because I knew that he was beating himself up over it. There's really nowhere to go, nowhere to hide. I mean, you'd like to crawl in a hole, but that sucked, man. That was brutal. So next pitch, another breaking ball, swing and miss, out. Now we're down 5-3. I can remember my entire focus was, was not on that we were down 5-3, to three. it was on Adam. It was the last inning of the game. It was looking pretty bleak at that point for us. Craig Ferry was the first guy to bat in that inning, and I think he had that mentality that he wasn't, it, the game wasn't going to be lost on his watch. I grab Bone by the shirt, pull him up, and I said, everybody get in here. I says, we are not going to lose this effing game. I took my bat, and I was kind of staring at it and having my moment, and it was kind of fitting to me because this was going to be my last at bat. Don't get yourself down two strikes. Joe Boo was more I don't want to say power hitter, but he was more of, he could strike out here. Not overly uh, religious, but uh, with my cleat carved across <laughs> in the ground. I didn't know we had Jesus on our side. Hey, baseball Jesus is always on our side. There was something about that moment when I got up to bat. I knew he was not going to strike me out. It would have been very easy to get up there and panic and start swinging and try to make something happen. And we just did not do that. You know, that was probably the best single I ever hit in my life. But when he got on, it was like, okay, you, you hit us in the face, but we're getting right back up. My whole thinking was put the ball in play. We're down two, we need three. I am so jacked, I can't feel the ground, I'm just shaking. First pitch comes in, it's the ball. Next two are balls, it's 3-0. We weren't allowed to swing at 3-0. You just didn't swing. You get on base. Coach standing there and he says, if it's there, hit it. So I'm like, just please throw me anything close and I'm coming out of my shoes. I'm gonna hit this to Chelsea from here. I get up there and I'm ready. And it's a pitch in the dirt. <laughs> so I was like, okay, I got the walk, so I get on base. Here we are, state final game, down two runs, and we're still taking pitches like he taught us. Get a ball that you can drive 
and it just so happens he wasn't giving us balls that we could hit. So we stood there, took our pitches, took our walks, and we all kind of know how that ended up. The pitcher's in trouble, and they're feeling the heat. And I just remember our crowd now is screaming. Their crowd's dead silent. The demeanor of the other team is there, scared to death. And looking at us like, this is just what we do. We got this. There's just no doubt. We got this. Yeah, I'm crapping my pants. But I remember telling myself, you know, just put a good swing on the ball, make contact. Uh, we have nobody out. Um, it was like a low outside fastball. And I just got under a little bit, but just, luckily it was just enough blooper to go over the second baseman's head. Chelsea loads the bases with no outs. Best feeling in baseball. I mean, you got bases loaded, no outs, and you're up to bat. I remember coming to bat with big hopes, big dreams, man. And I think I hit it right at the first baseman. Um, and he came home with it to get the force out. Why they didn't turn two on that, I don't know, and I'm really glad they didn't. I was never gonna hit into a double play. <laughs> yeah, I probably had four or five at-bats the whole season, and, and three or four of them were in that game, yeah. I remember hoping, like, I hope I get a pitch. I hope I get a chance, because I, I, want, I, want I wanna win the game. A hit and a walk later, the game is tied with one out. I mean, the guy at first base is on the ground. He's on the ground on his knees. I mean, who acts like that? Senior Jude Quilter steps to the plate with senior Rob Clem on third. I remember George Walton barking in my ear. He says, you better freaking score, there's a fly ball. Coach Welton called Jude over and he, he told us later, he said, Jude, you got one pitch to hit. And if you miss it, the next pitch, we're gonna run the, the squeeze bunt play to try and win the game. The squeeze is on once you have a strike on So, you didn't get to the second strike. <laughs> yeah, crack of the bat, I was pretty confident that it was gonna be good enough for, for a sacrifice fly. I think the only thing I, that went through my mind is uh, uh, don't leave early, don't trip, and I need to touch first base. With one strike, Quilter lofts the ball to left, which is just shallow enough for a strong-armed outfielder to have a chance at the plate. So sure scores, you're gonna see the ball into his glove, and then you're gonna run. So by the time you run, there's no chance they're gonna call you for leaving early. He's watching, you're not watching the ball, Coach Welton is, and as soon as the ball's gonna hit his glove, he's telling you to go. I remember being this far from Robbie's ear hole at third base. Tell him, sure score, sure score. You know, Robbie's a pretty solid runner, but it took forever for him to get the plate, it seemed like. In fact, I believe Ake will beat him there. <laughs> when, when he told me to go, I don't know if you've ever been to that point in your life where you're trying to run and you're not running. It felt like it took forever to run on that left field line. Coach Wayne Welton continues to bark out tag up instructions, instructions to Clem, who, who keeps, keeps his, his foot on the bag, bag and runs the fastest adrenaline pump 90 feet of his life and slides in safe. Celebration. Mass pandemonium. We come back to win it. Surreal. It was just, I, I couldn't believe you did it. We did it. I can't believe this. When they rushed the field, I remember getting crushed on a pile. It seemed like the whole town of Chelsea was out there celebrating. Lots of hugs, lots of telling everybody good job. I remember telling Jake, he really showed his heart and his desire and his talent there in that game. I remember a ton of people from the stands running out there and immediately the guy on the loudspeakers, please clear the field, please clear the field. At some point, uh, I cleated Molly. I absolutely remember being toppled in the bottom of the celebration pile by, by Craig Ferry. You're going to be in the pile, you're going to get stepped on. So. When the game ended, I remember watching Wayne. You got players jumping up and down and all of that. Wayne wasn't. Wayne was taking it in. Every moment of it. He was grabbing it. He was excited, he was thrilled, he was overwhelmed, he was all of that. 
but there was more of a absorbing that one great moment when he won it all. There was a trophy ceremony and they kind of lined us up and they called the seniors out last. And I remember going through the line and it's like, we all had handshakes and high fives. Like me and Clem did like a three minute individual high five doing all that. <laughs> and all the lines bunched up there because we're still doing our high five. When they gave the trophy to Coach Welton, he walked immediately over to, to me and to the other gathered seniors and handed the trophy to us and, and said something to the effect of, you know, these are the guys that deserve this trophy. It's not about me, it was about our team. And uh, so frankly, I, I couldn't give it to Kerry fast enough. I felt like I wanted to share that trophy with the crowd. And I think that's why I was walking, you know, towards the crowd. And that photograph just captured that moment perfectly for us. So the problem is, is I saw the photographer, so I was looking right at him. And then uh, I don't think some of the other guys did. So unfortunately, the, the picture that will live forever has uh, got my arm in front of Joe Boo's face. You don't know how often I hear about that. <laughs> They're like, are you in there? I'm like, yep, I'm right there. Uh, all you can really see is my number. You think, you know, it wasn't that long ago. Maybe he snapped off a few dozen, you know, but. Well, that's what we got our hands on, and I'm fine with it. I'm fine with it. I still get my hair cut at uh, Gary's. Yeah. He's, he still has the picture up. I, I'm not kidding you. Anytime there's anybody, I'm sitting in the chair, some little kid will walk in, and he'll point to that picture and ask the little kid, poor little kid, has to try to oh, find wow. me they in the no picture. <laughs> and they <laughs> never do. The big smile on Echo's face at uh, Spunk Williams about who he is. Sharing it with Molly, being in the picture was kind of cool. And just, to, I look at myself and think, boy, you, you're pretty relaxed. It's just like, seems like there ought to be a little bit more there or something. I think I was so probably satisfied that our work had paid off. It was the 11th time this season the Bulldogs won a game in their final at-bat. Welton called his team a team in the truest sense of the word. I'd go a step further and call them champions in the truest sense. It was a team that wouldn't quit believing in itself. 99% of high school teams would have wilted under the pressure. Sure, the Bulldogs have had exceptional pitching and solid defense, but talent did not make this team. Attitude, combined with senior leadership, did. Now, where do we get one of those signs for the village limits? Now it's funny because I think there's a healthy debate on whether that team, which obviously won, was really the best team or not. My brother likes to bring that up because his team made it to the Final Four in 2006. There's been a lot of really good teams, talented teams that, you know, don't do it because you know, for whatever reason, the, the little things like Coach Walton says. There's only four teams that end up smiling at the end of the year, and that's ABCD, the champion. When we won in 91, I never really let myself enjoy winning it. I was just thinking like, how do we duplicate this in 92? And there's so many things that have to go right. But Adam will, will carry those things on because probably of all of us guys, Coach Walton had probably as much or more influence on Adam than maybe anybody that I can think of. You know, I still see guys that we play now that their footwork's not right, or they don't block right, or they don't receive right. Coach those little things, and, and if you ignore someone doing it wrong, then you're accepting it, you know? He was really, really good at, at uh, demanding that. It's still a fun game. It has to be fun. It's, it's, it can be tough game as is, so it's got to be fun. It was the most fun I had ever around the game of baseball. <laughs> That's not my leg! <laughs> <laughs> to watch all you guys do what you did with the only people believing in it were the people in that dugout. It keeps you guys close together, which is what it's all about. 
I'm glad we won that. I'm glad we're still going. But personally, I think I got out of that season what I needed. It structured me for life the way I live. Wayne's stress of doing the little things was probably something that all of you guys have carried on throughout your, your adult life. Whether you're playing baseball or whether you're going to work every day. I mean, you guys all had uh, a heart for the game. After we were done in high school and I played around a little bit at Central, it just didn't even, it didn't even feel fun. I realized probably would never experience that type of culture, community-based feel ever again. I remember, you know, a bunch of good guys and, you know, a brother-in-law. Nobody else on the team that I know of played baseball with their brother-in-law. That's pretty cool. Those who say that high school sports can't stay with you, even if you're not an athlete, from the day you leave high school, it, they do. If you know what hard work is and know how to outwork everybody else, you got a good chance. Wayne taught that. He taught people how to take that and take it through life. I mean, you, you don't drop stuff like that. You take it with you. The difference of this team and uh, other teams are those friendships and those relationships that were established. Sometimes riding in a van, sometimes it's just uh, not wanting to, to be beat. And uh, that we all valued those seven letters on the front of our shirt more than any letters on the back of the shirt. This team did a really, really outstanding job holding on to the values that we tried to embrace doing little things, uh, working hard, having fun, and enjoying each other. I think at the end of the day for me, this team did that better than any other team I've coached.